Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Madison Reese. Um, I work for Church World Service. We are the Harrisonburg Immigration and Refugee Program. Um, we're the only refugee resettlement agency located in Harrisonburg, but we are not the only immigration office. We have a couple different offices who can do some similar immigration stuff that we do as well. Um, I am the acting volunteer coordinator. I help with airport arrivals. I help with cultural orientation. And then I also help with our interns. So I do quite a few different things in um, our Harrisonburg office, but um, the next closest resettlement office is going to be Winchester, which is a church world service office. And then we also, um, there is an international rescue committee located in Charlottesville, who is also a refugee resettlement office. But to get us started, um, we're going to start with a little bit of a background about Church World Service. Um, Church World Service started in 1946. It was born in the aftermath of World War II. 17 different church denominations came together, and that's where Church World Service, the name came from, is that 17 denominations coming together. And they came together to do in partnership what none of us could hope to do as well alone. Um, I love that quote because I think it's so important to our mission. Um, we still work heavily with volunteers, heavily with partner organizations um, and community members because we do believe that we can do more together than we can do alone. But our mission includes ending hunger, promoting peace and justice, um, and doing that through areas of food, water, assisting refugees, and assisting the vulnerable. Um, in 1946 to 1947, um, we did not start receiving refugees in the United States yet under Church World Service. We were just sending food to war-torn Europe and Asia. Um, we were sending up food, clothing, and medical supplies to those areas. It wasn't until um, 1980 with the Refugee Act of 1980 that Congress um, standardized the federal support that refugee resettlement agencies had to provide. And that's when a lot of offices for Church World Service started to pop up all over the United States. Um, and the Harrisonburg office was established in 1988. We are located on East Elizabeth Street, right by downtown. So CWS today, we have 37 United States-based member communions. So these are kind of similar to those church groups and um, that kind of came together in the beginning, but we're supported by 37 of those. If you're curious, if your church group is in one of them, you can actually search them on cwsglobal.org. They've got them listed. We're active in more than 30 countries and we're one of nine VOLOGs. A VOLOG is a voluntary agency that has a cooperative agreement with the State Department. So this standardizes the reception and placement services for all refugees that come into the United States. So all nine VOLOGs have to provide the same set of core services. Um, they just vary a little bit depending on what state they're in. Um, so services might have a little bit, might differentiate a little bit because of state requirements. But um, other examples of VOLOGs are Catholic Charities, International Rescue Committee, obviously Church World Service, um, or Lutheran Social Services. So CWS Harrisonburg, like I said, our office was established in 1988. Um, and our services start for our clients before they even come to the United States. Um, we typically assure a case, which means that we accept a case. Um, International Organization for Migration will send us um, travel information and information about our clients, and we will accept that. Um, the only time in Harrisonburg that we don't accept cases is if they have a certain medical need or they need a medical specialist that we don't have in the area. And that's just because we don't want people setting up a life um, away from a medical doctor that they need to see frequently. But as soon as we assure a case and we find out we receive their travel and find out that they're coming, our pre-arrival services start. And so we start thinking about where are they going to work? Um, where are they going to live? Are the kids going to go to school? They might have an 18-year-old. So we start thinking, will they want to go to high school or will they want to get their GED? So a lot of wheels start turning for a lot of different staff. Um, and then we get, when they arrive, we start working on our core services. These are the federally um, standardized services that refugee resettlement agencies have to provide. I'm not gonna spend time on core services right now because we're gonna go over them in depth a couple slides later. But most of our refugees are working um, before COVID. It was like 
around a month um, after their arrival, they were already starting work. Now it's a little more like two months just because um, getting all their paperwork and their proper documentation to start work is taking a little bit longer because of COVID and because of um, things just being backlogged at the moment. But after 90 days, clients no longer receive financial assistance from our office. Um, the United States government gives each refugee $1,025 to start their life in the United States. Um, and that's per person, per family. So a family of two would get $2,050 and a family of three would get $3,075 and so on. Um, but because we have that 90-day constraint, our goal is rapid self-sufficiency and integration for our clients. Um, we have to complete all of our core services within 90 days and then have that um, financial assistance paid out by the end of that 90 days. And that's um, a requirement through the federal government, not a requirement that we set. However, we can work with our clients for up to five years. Um, we can help them with employment if they want to switch jobs or if they want to get, um, or if they lost their job and need to get a new one. We can help them enroll their children in school. We can help adults if they're interested in going to college or getting their GED. Um, and we also provide some other things like driving classes and additional English classes as well. And then we provide our um, we provide our immigration resources through um, our staff are accredited through the Bu uh, Board of Immigration Appeals, and that's how we're able to put immigration in our name is because um, of our staff being accredited through that. So what makes somebody a refugee? Um, the first and most important thing to remember is that refugees are normal people just like you and I are. Um, however, they're people who had to leave their country because of conflict or persecution. And to be a refugee, to meet the legal definition, it needs to be because of one of these five things. It needs to be because of um, nationality, race, religion, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. That's really important because if they're not falling into one of those five categories, they don't meet the legal definition for refugee. And if they don't meet the legal definition for refugee, they aren't entitled to the benefits that refugees receive. So a good example is that with everything happening with climate change, sometimes we're starting to hear people refer to um, climate refugees, but according to the legal definition, because they're not being persecuted or um, there's not a conflict based on one of those five things. Climate, unfortunately, or natural disaster doesn't fall into those. They aren't categorized legally as refugees. But like I said, refugees are just ordinary people who found themselves in extraordinary circumstances. And by the nature of those circumstances, they have um, no option left but to leave. So refugees don't have to be from a particular country or ethnic group. Um, they can be from anywhere in the world as long as they meet that refugee definition. Um, and that definition was outlined in the 1951 Refugee, Con refugee Convention. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and read the legal definition of refugee. It's still the same one that was established in 1951 that we use today. But the definition is someone who is unable or unwilling to return to their country of origin owing to a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion. Um, and something I really like to point out in the definition that's really important is this is someone who is unable or unwilling to return to their country. So we're talking about people who have such a fear of like they're unable to go home because their lives are threatened. Um, these are people who returning home is not an option for them. And um, the statistic at the bottom, the UNHCR is the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Um, that number, 80 million, is actually from 2019. The updated number, from including 2021, is that there are 84 million forcibly displaced people worldwide. That includes refugees, asylum seekers, and internally displaced people. And we'll go over all those definitions in a little bit. Um, it's estimated that 26.4 of those people 26.4 million of that 84 million are refugees. And of that 26.4 million refugees, half of them are children under 18. Um, and that 68% of those um, refugees come from five countries. They come from Syria, Venezuela, the majority of them, 68% of the refugees in the world come from Syria, Venezuela, Afghanistan, South Sudan, and Myanmar. Um, 
And something else I also like to touch on in this part is just that a question I get asked is like, why doesn't their government help them? Um, a lot of times the countries that um, refugees are fleeing from had either a non-existent government, a weak government that can't protect them, or um, unfortunately, in some cases, we're seeing the government participate in the persecution of um, the refugees that are fleeing. A really good example of that is Myanmar. Um, we're seeing the government participate in some of the persecution of um, the minority groups that are there. So now we're going to spend some time on some terminology. And terminology is important because what status you have de um, determines what benefits you're eligible for. So we started with refugee. We went over it a little bit. But a refugee is someone who receives permission to enter into the United States from an outside country. And then refugees are resettled through the United States Refugee Admi Admissions Program um, with the help of a resettlement agency like Church World Service. Um, so there's kind of three pieces of the puzzle for refugees. They're in their home country. They leave and cross an international border and go into another country. And then the United States invites them from that neighboring country into the United States. So there's kind of three different countries that they go through their home country, a host country outside of the borders of their home country. And then they come get invited into another um, country to be resettled into. So there's three different countries. Asylum seeker is a little bit different. An asylum seeker is someone who's already inside of the United States when they apply for protection. So um, asylum seekers have to prove that they have that well-founded fear for their life based on one of those same five reasons. And when they um, can prove it in immigration courts, they may receive refugee status. So asylum seeker is a different status than refugee status. And asylum seekers, if they um, are approved for refugee status, they'll be entitled to some of the same benefits as refugees. <clears throat> the next one is special immigrant visa. This is extremely important when we're talking about our Afghan refugees because um, this is the program that most of them fall under and the status that most of them will fall under. So these are people who worked for the US government in Afghanistan and they have um, a contract with the US government that if they work for the US government, they will be given protection and then later permanent status in the United States. People under SIV or special immigrant visa never have to flee to another country. They never have to cross an international border. They are brought directly to the United States. And then they have access to the same services provided by refugee resettlement agencies. Um, so kind of what happened with Afghanistan when the United States decided to fully withdraw the rest of its troops, we were kind of faced with the problem of, um, okay, do we leave people behind who we've made promises to that we would protect them and give them permanent status in the United States, but their contracts might be might not be completely done? Um, or do we leave, do we leave them behind or do they we bring them with us? And um, that's when we chose to bring the majority of them with us is because they fell under the special immigrant visa and we had told them we'll protect you and we'll give you permanent status in the United States. And then the last one is humanitarian parole or a parolee. Um, this is someone, it's a temporary status and this allows someone to stay in the United States while they apply to become a special immigrant visa or while they apply to become a refugee. Um, so while they're applying for a longer term relief. It used to be one year that you would get under humanitarian parole, but because of everything with Afghanistan, they've extended it to two years because they just realized that documentation was taking too long and that people weren't be get, being given a proper amount of time to apply for another status. So humanitarian parole is now granted, sorry, I'll wait till that stops, is now granted for two years while refugee, or excuse me, while um, parolees, try to apply for a separate status. And then I also do, this one isn't on here, but I do wanna to touch on an IDP, an internally displaced person, is someone who um, is being um, persecuted or facing conflict um, for the same five reasons, but they have not left the borders of their country. So an internally displaced person is someone who could be facing conflict or persecution, um, but they decided to remain within their country. Um, obviously, IDPs don't have a lot of rights from outside countries because they've um, remained inside their country, just so that that is clear. 
So how and why we protect refugees. Refugees are protected under international law. That definition was set out in 1951. And then there was a 1967 protocol that adjusted the um, requirements for refugees. Um, 1967 protocol removed the geographic and time limitations. Um, there was at the when the convention was first set and the refugee status was established, um, the refugee definition was established. Um, it had geographic limitations to just people in Europe, and then they started to realize there's refugees from all over the world. We need to um, have a definition that includes everybody. And then they removed time limitations. I'm not entirely sure why, but my guess would be is that these conflicts are lasting for such a long time that um, the time limitations would need to be like 50 years for them to encompass um, everybody who falls into the refugee category. Um, a great example, I've seen some people who are coming from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. They filed in the late 90s and they're just not being placed um, in 2021, 2022 into their resettled country. So these are really, really long lasting conflicts that um, there might not be an end in sight for people. So they did away with the time limitations. But one of the most important ways that we, not one of them, probably the most important way that we protect refugees is this principle of non-refoulement. And this states that under international human rights that um, a country can't deport someone back to a territory where his or her life would be threatened on account of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion. So this essentially states that if a refugee does something wrong, we can't deport them back to where we know that they are unsafe. Um, they still will face consequences like any other US citizen um, and they would face the same consequences that any other, they would go through the system just like anyone else would, but we can't deport them back somewhere where we kind of know it's a death wish um, by sending them back to a country where we know they're not safe. And that's just really important because it prevents people um, from trying to send people back into situations where we know that they're unsafe. So now we're going to spend a little time talking about the refugee journey. I think that this is one of the most popular um, things that people see like in the news and one of the most popular things that people read about when it comes to refugee is like refugee camps. Um, but we're going to go through kind of what the journey might look like. I'm going to start with the pre-escape. So this is before they actually leave their home country. This is usually characterized by war, severe discrimination, or persecution of minority groups. Um, this is when people might start thinking, oh no, it's getting really dangerous. I'm starting to get worried for my life, for my family's life. They start to get anxiety and get scared um, and start feeling pressure about, okay, maybe we need to leave. Something I hear a lot from people, this pre-escape is the mindset of, oh, it's going to get better. Oh, this is just temporary. It'll blow over like it did last time. So it's kind of this like, um, still reasoning with themselves that they can make it work and that they wanna stay in their country. And I always like to note, um, nobody wants to leave their home. Nobody wants to leave behind everything they're comfortable with, everything they've ever known to go somewhere brand new where they don't know anybody and where they don't speak the same language. Um, these aren't people who are fleeing for a better life. These are people who are fleeing for their lives. Um, I just always like to mention that it's not people who um, are excited that their lives were uprooted where they were just to be moved somewhere else. And then we have the actual escape. So this is what it sounds like. This is when people are actually forced to flee. Um, some people leave secretly, some are chased out, but a lot of people die through this part um, just because um, some of the regions of the world where people are coming from, there are mountain ranges around them. So they'll go through mountain ranges to get into neighboring countries. Um, some people, some governments set up border patrols um, that will have people um, shoot people if they see them trying to leave. Um, some people have to cross other like geographic boundaries like rivers or oceans and things like that, uh, not oceans, seas, and um, people might drown. So there's lots of people who die in this escape portion, unfortunately, from, um, they might die of starvation, they might die of thirst from different things, but the people who do escape successfully, um, those are considered refugees because they've, exit, they've exited that um, international border of their home country. After that, refugees typically go one of two places. They go to refugee camps or they become an urban refugee. So a refugee camp is a camp and they are typically established um, 
inside of the neighboring countries of a country of conflict. So um, they would flee into a neighboring country of their home country. These are set up in partnership of the local government and of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. Um, in the camps, the UNHCR tries to establish, they try to set up food and water places for people to go pick stuff up. Um, people do start to, in refugee camps, kind of build lives. They try to find ways to make money, whether it be like fixing people's clothes, weaving, um, sewing, or being a barber. People do try to start their lives here because the average time spent in a refugee camp is 10 years. This is not a small piece of the puzzle. This is an extremely big part of their lives. Um, and these are not the best conditions. It's a lot of like tent-like conditions in refugee camps. Um, so they're very susceptible to um, exploitation in these situations. They're very vulnerable while they're in refugee camps. Um, and then there's urban refugees. So this is kind of what it sounds like. People who, instead of going into a refugee camp, go to a neighboring city. Um, and they try to live autonomously, make money, and start their lives there. But that also presents dangers just because refugees, if they don't have proper documentation or don't speak the language, they may be um, vulnerable to exploitation, arrest, or detention, um, and are often forced to compete for the lowest working conditions in those other countries. But from there, um, there's three other options. The first is voluntary repatriation. This is um, if something changes in their homeland and they're able to return home, then, um, and it's safe for them, some refugees will. This is, of course, the primary hope because everybody wants to go back home. Um, obviously, people want to go back to their homes and to everything that they've known. But unfortunately, this seldom happens quickly, if at all, just because, like I mentioned earlier, these conflicts are so long standing and have been going on for so long that um, it's pretty rare that we see people going back to their home country. The next option is local integration. This is the most popular option. Um, this is when people will take up residency in that neighboring host country. Um, and this is really common when the neighboring country has a similar language or culture because it's really a lot easier for people to assimilate. Um, and this is the most popular option because the last option is resettlement and not everybody is um, eligible to be resettled into another country. So a lot of people start to integrate into those neighboring host countries where refugee camps are established. Um, and something else that I didn't mention that I do wanna go back and mention about refugee camps, um, the UNHCR does try to ensure that basic needs are met for refugees in the camps. But in some of these camps, we're talking about camps that have hundreds of thousands of people. Um, so it can be a lot to meet but they do try to give them shelter, water, set up education sites to close the education gap for kids who are refugees. Um, and they also try to um, integrate as many of the refugees in the camps as they can to help them to be involved in that process. So who is eligible to be resettled into another country? So this is the resettlement definition from the UNHCR. And it's the careful selection by governments for purposes of lawful admission of the most vulnerable refugees who can neither return to their home countries nor live in safety in neighboring host countries. So two really important things, the most vulnerable refugees. So the only people who are eligible to be resettled into another country, into a third country, like the United States, are those who are the most vulnerable. Um, People considered the most vulnerable are those who have medical needs, women or girls at risk, children at risk, or survivors of violence or torture. Those are people who fall under that most vulnerable category, who would not be able to integrate successfully into that neighboring country that they're in. Um, in 2019, one in 500 refugees was resettled globally. That is 0.25%. So one quarter of 1% of the world's refugees in 2019 was resettled in, um, into a third country. Um, and no one who's committed that statistic, all, every time I say it, it's like my least favorite part of this because it's such a small number, but um, anyone who has committed a serious crime or might pose any type of security threat is not eligible to be resettled. Um, to not, is not eligible to be resettled. But the UNHCR goes through and does 
interviews and collects documentation and helps determine who those vulnerable people are. Um, and like I said, they're the most vulnerable and these are people who can't ever go back home or who can't integrate properly and live safely in their neighboring host country. So that's how they determine it. So once someone is um, identified for refugee status determination um, or RSD, this is at the very top here, we see, like I said, the UNHCR interviews and collects documentation, determines who can be resettled. Once they determine them, there's a massive vetting process that takes place. Um, the middle part, the security by biometric and medical screening, this is this massive vetting process. Refugees are some of the most vetted people that come into the United States. Um, I get asked a lot, who, do we know who these people are? How do we know um, who these people are who are coming into our country? And that's a very valid and important question to ask. But refugees are some of the most vetted people who come into the United States. We know a lot about them when they're entering into the US. And part of the reason is because they go through this whole process. Um, they do eight screening with eight different agencies that includes the State Department, Department of Homeland Security, FBI, um, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services, and other agencies. They go through six security database checks. They do biometric screening that includes iris scans of their eyes, facial, um, facial, scran facial scans, um, fingerprinting, they do a comprehensive medical screening um, and they do, um, well, actually, I think that's everything. They go through all of that screening, but that whole process takes on average two years for someone to complete the process. Um, the unfortunate thing is that if something happens during that process, if someone decides to get married or if someone gets pregnant, they need to start the whole process over. Um, so um, I mentioned earlier, refugees are in refugee camps on average for about 10 years. So what we start to see is people balancing and deciding, okay, we've, we came into the camp as a newlyweds um, or a young couple and we want kids. But if we have a baby, we have to start the process over. So they have to weigh deciding if they want to have a kid and then start the whole process over um, or wait to have kids and maybe still be waiting five years because that's how long it takes for them to get placed somewhere. Um, or we see um, people are spending so much time in camps that maybe they meet someone and they would like to get married um, and they're faced with the choice of, okay, do we hope that we're gonna be resettled soon um, or do we get married and start the process over? And the unfortunate thing with that is if, couples aren't married, there is no guarantee that they'll get placed not only in the same like state, but there's no guarantee they'll get placed in the same country if they're not married because they're filed under separate cases. So that's part of the reason why we see stays in refugee camps lasting so long, just part of the puzzle, um, because people are forced to make life decisions while they're there. Um, but when someone does get approved and they get through the entire process, um, they get, when they're coming to the United States, other countries that take refugees, um, the United Kingdom, Germany, the United States, most of Europe, Belgium, France, all of them, Canada also takes refugees. But when they do get assigned to the United States, um, the UN tries to prioritize placing them near family members if possible. It's not always guaranteed, but they do try. Um, but then the International Organization for Migration arranges their travel. And then they ping us and tell us um, that we will be receiving or when the arrival is, when their flight is coming in. And that, after all of that, is when Church World Service finally comes into the picture. Um, and that's when they arrive in the United States. And that these are our core services. And these are the services I mentioned earlier that we have to provide in the first 90 days after arrival. Um, this is why our program is designed for rapid self-sufficiency because we have a lot of things we have to do with our clients. Um, but we provide them safe, sanitary, and most importantly, affordable housing. Um, we give them a cent, we furnish their house for them. So we give them essentials, which is we give them a couch, we give them a dining room table, we give them brand new um, mattresses and pillows and then beds. Um, 
any other pots, pans, cooking supplies, um, silverware, any other essential items to be functioning in a house, we give them. In the winter, we give them necessary clothing. So we'll give them um, winter coats and hats and gloves. Um, we provide them with food until their food allowance um, or till their food benefits kick in, till their EBT cards arrive. Um, but we do sign them up for EBT cards, which is essentially food stamps. We um, take, them, take them to their first health screening with the health department and then establish them with a primary care provider. We aid them in their employment search, give them transportation to the interviews and interpretation, but we get them their first job. Um, we have partnerships with employers throughout the Shenandoah Valley. And then we also set up reliable transportation to their jobs. We register their kids in school and provide follow-up services. So if someone wanted us to go with them to a parent-teacher conference, we could do that as well. Um, and then we also help get all the vaccines that kids need, kids need for school before going. We apply for all their social services. So like I said, that EBT card, their Medicaid, TANF when it's applicable. We apply for their social security card. We put them into English classes. And if they wanna continue English classes after their 90th day, we help them find resources and set up those classes and transportation. And then we also provide them with cultural orientation, which is a variety of 15 topics covering basic 101s about living in the United States. So we go over housing and how to talk to your landlord. We go over transportation, how to use Uber or the bus system or how to get a bike. Um, and then we go over cultural adjustment, which are just things that might be different here in the United States, like kids can't stay home alone until they're a certain age. Um, kids need to be in car seats or different things like that. Um, like I said, this is why our program is designed for rapid self-sufficiency, because we have a lot to do in the first 90 days for our clients. Um, typically, most of this stuff doesn't cost a lot of money. We have outside funding. We have federal funding to support it. We have really generous donors who help us as well. And then we have grants that have been received by um, staff. But what we do with that $1,025 most of the time is we pay client security deposits for their house and then we pay forward their rent and as much of their utilities as we can so that our clients can focus on working and kind of building up a cushioning and getting comfortable in the United States before they're thinking about paying all of these bills um, and thinking about paying big bills, especially. So this is a pie chart of our arrivals in 2015 to 2020. And I left this in here because um, it's still applicable, obviously, but on the next slide, I have our 2021 with, with our pie chart, including 2021. Um, but this kind of shows you where we receive people from. The majority historically had been Democratic Republic of the Congo and then Iraq and then Ukraine. Um, after 2021, Afghanistan had a much larger portion. So pre-2021, the majority was Democratic Republic of the Congo. It was 288 people. After 2021, Afghan, we received so many people from Afghanistan because of everything that happened. They are almost equal to how many people we've gotten from the Democratic Republic of the Congo in the last seven years. So they make up a much larger portion of the picture now. Um, and then I also just like people to see where else we get people from. Pakistan, um, Belarus, Sudan, Syria is also a really common one that we get people from. Um, but we did the actual numbers. We received 192 Afghan refugees in five months. So Afghans seeking refuge. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but um, essentially what happened, I mentioned this earlier, when the United States decided to fully withdraw from Afghanistan, we had a choice to make. We had to um, bring the people with us who are in the SIV program or we were going to leave them there. Um, and fortunately, we chose to bring them with us. What happened with the base camps is that the United States just needed to put them there to go through that entire vetting process. It was not a detention center. It was just for them to be able to do all that vetting that is usually done in another country for them to do it here. And that was the safest place for them to be while they did that. Um, Afghans received the same access, the same CDC guidelines for COVID that everyone else in the United States received. They have the same access to vaccines and to boosters, just like everyone else did. And then, of course, like I just said, we've received 192 Afghans in Harrisonburg. 
And um, before we go on to how I can help, I do wanna go over two really important people. Um, the first is Malala Yousafzai. So she is from Pakistan. I guess before I get into who they are, um, I always like to mention human life is inherently important and inherently valuable. And I put these two examples on here because I like people to realize the impact that can be had when we believe that because both of these people are refugees and um, because someone believed that their life was inherently important and inherently valuable, they've changed the world as we know it. Um, but first is Malala Yousafzai. So she's from Pakistan and she was shot by the Taliban when she was 15 years old for going to school. Um, so she was shot at 15 and she survived. And then she went on by 17, so not even two years later, to win the Nobel Peace Prize in recognition for her efforts on behalf of children's rights. And um, Malala still, she created the Malala Fund, and that's an organization that through education empowers women and girls to achieve their potential and to become confident and to act as strong leaders in their own country and enact change in their own home countries. So Malala continues to be a powerful voice and a leader for women and girls rights all over the world and to inspire people. And because someone believed that her life was inherently important as a refugee and inherently valuable, we know that now, how important that she is. And I'm sure that she will go on to continue to change the world as we know it. And the same for Albert Einstein. Um, actually, he was a refugee who was born in Germany, but he was known as a Jewish scientist. Um, so when Nazis rose to power, he actually fled and was accepted into the United States. And I won't spend too much time on all the things that he has done, because I think most people know all the things that he's done. Um, but he did win a Nobel Prize in physics and established many theories that altered the scientific world as we knew it then and still as we know it now. So because people valued their lives and valued them as humans, they drastically changed the world as we know it. And they drastically did things that affect even our lives today. Um, so I always just like to make sure to touch on how important human life is. And that's what um, part of what working with refugees is, is recognizing that anybody from any part of the world is inherently important and is inherently valuable. And then of course, how can you help? So there's a couple different ways that people can get involved at Church World Service. Um, the first is you can donate. We have a donation list that I'm happy to send out. Um, we also accept donations of gift cards to local grocery stores like Walmart, Food Lion, um, or Target. And those go directly towards buying stuff for our clients, sometimes directly towards groceries and sometimes directly towards um, other things if they need other essentials. So then we also take household, um, gently used household items and cleaning, brand new cleaning supplies and brand new toiletry items are the most popular. Um, and then of course we take financial donations. If you want um, your donation to go directly to Harrisonburg, you can go to cwsharrisonburg.org and donate through our website. Um, that money comes directly to us and directly to our clients, and it will be spent in Harrisonburg. It will not go to CWS Greater. And then, of course, you can volunteer. We've got a massive list of volunteer opportunities, um, ranging from cooking hot meals for people the first night they arrive, to being a school tutor, to helping people learn how to ride the bus. And then the last, but absolutely one of the most important, is advocating. It's really important that we keep a positive rhetoric around refugee resettlement. Um, a good way to do that is when you volunteer with us, share your positive stories about working with refugees and working with our office. Um, advocate to your local leaders, vote in your local elections and your national election for leaders who support refugee resettlement and find it important. And then one of that is just particularly important right now because of the housing market, Advocating to landlords that they should be open to renting to refugees is very important as well. Um, and then before there's any questions, I do wanna say, um, I'm from the Harrisonburg community. And so this is my community as well. And I love that I am able to tell people, to tell our clients when they're coming from um, the airport that they're coming into a community that is going to support them and welcome them with open arms and that celebrates diversity and is excited for them to be here. Um, Harrisonburg has been 
as a community, tremendously supportive to us in the last few months when we were receiving Afghan refugees. And it just really warms my heart to know that I am able to welcome them into a community that is really excited to have them here.